Ontario's got plenty of towns and cities whose major industries were shaken up by the decline in manufacturing and other serious economic disruptions of the past few decades. But some municipalities are finding new ways to thrive. Here to tell us more, Deborah Cohen, Associate Professor of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto and part of U of T's new School of Cities. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to meet you, Deborah. It's great to be here. Thank you. So Ontario, a big province. Uh, within the province, there's, oh, there's 444 different municipalities. So I'm thinking, depending on where you live in the province, it's easier to reinvent yourself than if you live in an, a different part, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of thinking geographically about things. So sure. tell, if somebody lived, if a, a municipality was in the north of the province compared to the south of the province, what kind of challenges would they have in if they had to reimagine themselves? Right. Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, not all municipalities are the same. Mm -hmm. And we have um, engines like Toronto without being overly Toronto centric, which holds um, almost half the province's population and is a driver, not just for the province, but then the national economy. And so there's a whole range of municipalities around Toronto, um, municipalities um, like that we might imagine as declining municipalities that are actually um, in a very different position in relation to growth and decline because of their proximity to Toronto mm -hmm. than if we are talking about Sault Ste. Marie or Thunder Bay, for instance. Uh, I want to read something from the World Bank and then we, I want to delve more into the conversation of what's been happening around the world. Heavy industries like steel making and automobile assembly once powered some of the world's mightiest economic urban areas. Traditional manufacturing industries shaped their identity, giving their citizens income and pride. But globalization, competition, shifting trade patterns, and changing consumer trends are continuously reshaping the competitive landscape with dramatic impact on cities and people. How are shifting forces in the global economy affecting towns and cities here in Ontario? Yeah, that's a, it's a really crucial question. I mean, it's not a new question. This has been a kind of process of change we've been seeing for probably half a century. Um, we've been certainly seeing a kind of shift from manufacturing intensive economies to more service oriented economies. And, you know, that's come with it a lot of dramatic change for cities. Um, the, probably the, the most palpable change has been in terms of the decline of the middle income or middle class um, kind of population. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really a result of deindustrialization, um, the, the loss of strong unions, but also the welfare state decline. And I think, you know, we, we can imagine iconic cities like south of the border, like the Detroit's or Buffalo or Flint, Michigan. I think Michael Moore made a film about Flint uh, more than uh, probably almost 40 years ago That's now. his hometown, right? Yeah, Roger mm -hmm. and me. Um, and so that the, the combination of the deindustrialization, de but also with intense racism um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the water crisis and the continued economic um, uh, marginalization of places like that are, are quite marked. In the um, north of the border, um, we ha we certainly have seen the decline of manufacturing. So we can talk about um, even in Toronto, even in the city of Toronto, we can think about how in the early 1980s, uh, more than 20% of the working population was working in manufacturing, and today it would be less than 10%. We can think about a kind of maybe more classic city like Hamilton, where we've certainly seen a major decline of steel production, and and then all the um, that manufacturing economies that relied on on uh, that employment and, and that engine. Um, so there's absolutely no question to me that there's been a massive shift in uh, the kind of economies that we are, um, our cities are, are experiencing. Um, I wanna complicate that a little bit though, and there's maybe three, way? three ways I would complicate that. The mm -hmm. first is, um, you know, I think we, um, we tend to think about decline in places that are experiencing decline as like, you know, bad places that need to figure out how to catch up to the, the, the good places that are experiencing growth, like mm -hmm. engine, engines of growth, like whether it's Toronto or whether it's other uh, cities that are, that are not declining in that kind of measure of abstract measure at the level of the whole city. Um, at the same time, I think if we look more carefully at what's happening within cities um, and, and across urban space, um, we would have to see that decline is a much more nuanced and much more complicated phenomenon that happens at every scale. So for instance, um, I've done quite a bit of work in East Scarborough, a community that has experienced a, a lot of decline in terms of household income, um, loss of manufacturing jobs, and the racialization of poverty in that community. But we don't we, we don't tend to imagine that happening in relation to what's happening in the downtown. Um, and so we need to, we need to I think, this 
I did a big report a few years ago, and one of the central arguments is that we can't understand the growth of um, the kind of engine of growth in the downtown without understanding the decline. that kind of decline. And I think we could say the same thing regionally. Mm -hmm. There was a scholar, uh, Jean Gottman, who um, in the 1950s was writing about a term he called megalopolis. Mm -hmm. And what he was suggesting was that the whole corridor of the northeastern United States, from Baltimore up into Boston, really could be understood as one functionally integrated urban region. And I think we could say the same for much of our region. So, for instance, uh, we have, um, we've heard earlier this summer that um, in Toronto, we have uh, 50 percent of the population that is rent burdened, having a really hard time paying rent and, and it's in an unsustainable way. But what we know is happening is that as people in, in Toronto, for instance, are experiencing affordability crises, they're moving out. And, and that's going to affect the, the cities that they're moving into. Exactly. And probably displace the people that are living in those cities. Exactly. So it's like a ripple effect. Exactly. Um, you mentioned Hamilton before. Yeah. Um, Hamilton was a city that was built on steel. Mm -hmm. uh, Windsor and Oshawa have also had to um, cope with decline in their main industries, and that was for the auto sector for the latter two. Mm -hmm. uh, so walk me through uh, those three cities. We'll start with Hamilton and how Hamilton was able to reinvent itself. Well, Hamilton, I think, is the, is the story I know best of the three. Um, and I think it's a story like Oshawa that can't really be entirely separated from Toronto. I, even, even a city like Windsor is, is part of this kind of broader region, what we might call the Greater Golden Horseshoe, mm -hmm. or um, I think that's the newest term and the most expansive one. So it's a really a, a regional question at this point, I would say. Um, in a place like Hamilton, we have seen, I would say, a lot of change that is not just about deindustrialization, but about this, this um, kind of new forms of growth that are happening. And, you know, we, we hear a lot of, of stories about the growth of whether it's um, McMaster or Mohawk College, um, the new forms of knowledge economy that are kind of taking shape. Um, and no doubt that's, that's really important. We also hear about um, arts-based uh, community investment and growth in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. But the main story in Hamilton from colleagues of mine, um, like Sarah Wakefield, Professor Sarah, Sarah Wakefield, who's also in my department, who's been studying Hamilton and working with communities in Hamilton for many years, is actually one of income polarization, not one of just a happy story of reinvention. And in fact, um, another professor, Richard Harris, who works at McMaster, has been um, talking quite a bit in the media about how a lot of the change that's happening in downtown Hamilton is a result of um, commuters from Toronto who are no longer able to afford to buy housing here, and so they're buying up the more affordable Victorian homes and other kinds of... And um, then commuting. Absolutely. Right. I actually teach um, a really large first-year urban course, 800 students um, at UF University of Toronto, and we did a little exercise this year. Um, you know, I always expect that there's going to be students from across the 416, maybe even across the 905, but we're increasingly finding that we have students from the 705, from Windsor, from, you know, people who are commuting hours every day each direction just to get to school or work because that's what makes their lives affordable. So where does that piece fit into the idea that um, Hamilton or a city like Oshawa has reinvented itself? Is it just maybe being like usurped into the closest region that's doing well? Well, I think um, not it's not necessarily about um, just whether it's, it's tied into Toronto, but around what that growth looks like or what that renewal looks like. Mm -hmm. There's a long-standing kind of lesson in, in, um, in the, the scholarship on gentrification, which suggests that a lot of the push for gentrification and the effects of gentrification are about cleaning up the neighborhood, but not really so much concern about the people who've lived there. So there's beautification efforts and you know efforts to maybe fill the storefronts and make sure that there's new housing starts. But the concerns for the local population are not necessarily at the forefront. Mm -hmm. And partly what's interesting about those two cities is I've heard that there's been a lot of movement actually from Hamilton, people who are being displaced from um, new forms of, um, of housing development and rising um, uh, property costs and, and property taxes, who are actually moving to Brantford and um, Oshawa and those regions because they're considered more affordable. Um, one of the, the, um, the things I, I wanted to mention about Hamilton and specifically, but also I think other areas that are looking towards the knowledge economy as a source of growth, 
is that that's not necessarily going to get us out of these problems. If we think of some of the core problems of our cities right now, is not just you know there's a there's a declining city and here's a good model of growth, but that across even in the center of the most prosperous of our cities or municipalities, that decline and inequality and especially income polarization and racialized income polarization are at the center of cities that are supposedly doing really well. So, so do you think that needs to be addressed first? I in think order that's I think that is the crucial question because that's a that's a phenomenon whether it's Hamilton whether it's Toronto whether it's Oshawa and even whether it's some of these more peripheral or um, areas municipalities that are not as close to the, that kind of center of the um, engine of the economy well you mentioned knowledge-based as uh, some of these cities are transforming themselves because they have uh, universities colleges um, but if a city doesn't have that um, what else can they do to a attract or to reinvent themselves? Well, I think, you know, again, it, it sort of depends on how we see what the problem is. If the problem is not just about um, uh, some kind of more abstract notion of decline, but a much more fine-grained idea of um, income polarization and growing disparities within municipalities and across municipalities, not just between them, then I think we would have to start from a different place. I think we would have to um, think about um, what does it mean to, to create good jobs and, and to think about livelihoods. Um, but even, you know, just earlier this summer, we heard that 44% of <coughs> Canadian children are living in income, uh, sorry, daycare deserts, they're calling them, um, areas where there's not adequate childcare. And so I think, um, you know, we might think about, you know, connecting cities up and the importance of things like transit and uh, as, as important infrastructure for reinvesting in cities. And it is, for sure. We need a lot more of that, especially in a, a very congested urban region like the one we're in right now. But we can also think about social infrastructure. And in, in a lot of communities that are experiencing, uh, that are struggling with decline, that are struggling um, to, to find um, new sources of, of employment um, and, and to sustain livelihood for their residents, um, we need to think about what, what social infrastructure might do in order to support those communities. An example of social infrastructure is what? So like daycares um, mm -hmm. or like um, community spaces. You know, it's, it's, there's some irony. Some of the communities I've worked in that are either um, non-urban or suburban um, have in some sense, it's, they seem to have a lot of space, right? There's, um, you know, either big open spaces around apartment towers or open fields around the towns themselves. But in terms of um, indoor community spaces or spaces that people can use in our long winters right. um, in, in this country, um, it's it's really limited. So the space is important. Um, various kinds of social um, services. Um, Involving residents in the planning of their own communities is, is absolutely crucial. And I think some of the most creative initiatives for change are not coming from municipalities. They're coming from communities. They're coming from First Nations and other indigenous communities. They're coming from social movements. And I think it's a moment where we need to be bold. I think we're at a, a, you know, the kinds of crises that we face, both socially, environmentally, and in terms of indigenous settler relations, it's a time that I think there's a real need for change, but also a real thirst for it. I, as I mentioned, I teach a lot of these really big classes of, of young people who yeah. are, um, you know, unanimously, um, and I say that, you know, as, as having done some research with them, unanimously uh, and anxious about their futures, but also really open to thinking differently about what, what an urban future looks like. Well, you mentioned the younger people, um, and, it, and you said they have these great ideas, but oftentimes when a city um, faces decline and there's no jobs, uh, young people are forced to leave. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of impact do you have that has long term on a city? Oh, it can it can have a tremendous impact. I mean, um, we've we've seen that in so many um, areas of the the north and in rural communities. I mean, one of the um, the things that's important to remember, though, is that what's happening in cities is not just you can't like have this bordered perspective on cities. So yes, absolutely, a city like Toronto or other bigger cities are drawing in a lot of the population from more peripheral areas or areas that aren't experiencing that growth. Absolutely, and we're seeing you know a lot of communities that are in smaller, more remote areas um, aging um, mm -hmm. and not experiencing the same kinds of um, investment of new talent or uh, young young people's energies. Um, at the same time, I think it's a little bit of a myth to see these places as completely disconnected. So we tend to think about Toronto as a knowledge economy based on um, the universities and the financial district. But one of the things that Toronto is known for in the international literature and in the international communities is, is mining. 75% um, of the headquarters of mining com corporations, and I'm talking globally, not just Canadian, mining corporations are located in Toronto on Bay Street. 
And so we have to think about what are those relationships. So um, I do, I'm doing some work at, with communities up in the north that mm -hmm. seem so far away, um, and thinking about you know areas like the Ring of Fire that are set to experience potentially, um, especially with the new premier, um, some very very um, fast Positive moving. Us, yeah. um, you know the premier is going to get on the the bulldozer himself. He says. Now those are communities that are experiencing. I would say the most persistent form of marginalization, the most extreme forms of poverty, and the most extreme uh, deficits of very basic infrastructure. I'm talking about housing, I'm talking about water, you know, um, that are fueling suicide crises. So there's been over 500 youth suicides in the north of, of Canada over the last 20 years or so. Um, these are some of the communities that I think when we're talking about decline, we really need to be thinking about quite centrally. And it kind of raises like another point that I wanted to think about in relation to decline more broadly when I was sort of wanting to complicate the picture, which is for many communities, whether it was pre-industrial, industrial, industrial or post-industrial, across that time spectrum, they have not been included in the project of, e of economic growth. And in fact, if we think about the kind of um, center of the, the, you know, the industrial engine of, of our province, um, that um, groups like um, the Anishinaabe population, the First Nations population in the the same corridor that um, we see in the, the strongest forms of industrial growth, we're experiencing the toxic effects of what's known now as Chemical Valley. So I think we need to think really creatively about who is who are we thinking about when we talk about decline? And what does it mean to actually to prioritize issues of, of equity, issues of environmental sustainability? You know, it's, it's great to build jobs, uh, to, to build new economies, but if mm -hmm. we're making the water undrinkable, um, it's, it's hardly getting us very far. So I think we really need to think across these kinds of divisions we sometimes mm -hmm. have both about here and there um, but also about like ecology and economy well what I'm hearing uh, what I think I'm hearing from you is that um, we might have 444 different municipalities but we're actually more connected absolutely um, and absolutely. what if you uh, could give some advice for the new government and how to make sure you know that the north is involved or some of the issues that you brought up what would you tell them I would say to, to listen to communities. We have incredibly um, sophisticated, thoughtful initiatives coming out of communities. And, and I think communities are getting increasingly frustrated um, with the status quo. So we're seeing rent strikes in not just Toronto, but in, in Hamilton. We're seeing, um, you know, just a, a couple months ago, TVO reported on vandalism in downtown Hamilton on Lock Street um, because there was, um, uh, so much rapid Tensions, gentrification, yeah, yeah. right? So these are these are not like subtle issues, and I think we're going to find that we either we have the choice of either addressing them and like listening to what the problems are, centering questions of environmental sustainability and social equity in our planning and in our in our um, visions of urban futures, or we're going to we're going to just face more fractious kinds of futures. NAFTA renegotiations have left many of our communities hanging. Um, what can these areas do to cope with such uncertainty? It's a great question, and I was thinking of you know. I've been thinking a lot about NAFTA, as many people have, and how not, not too long ago it was um, considered a problem for um, industry and for industrial employment, and now there's a real um, question and set of concerns around what, what um, any kind of suspension or weakening of NAFTA might do. I think it's a really open question, and I think you know, there's, NAFTA certainly was part of it. Didn't, it didn't create deindustrialization by any means, and there's a lot of complicated debates around what the impacts have been on um, the Canadian industrial economy, um, but there's no question that it was part of, it's been part of these kinds of transformations. Um, I think, you know, regardless of the agreements with uh, cross-border agreements, continental relations, I think one of the future kinds of promises that we, we can see that so many different communities are, are lobbying for is a lot more embedded economies, economies that are not stretched all over the world, you know, where you have, for instance, shrimp farmed in Scotland and then shipped to China to be peeled and then shipped back to a European market for consumption, which is really only makes sense if you're thinking about a bottom dollar, but certainly not if you're thinking about fuel or, or even the jobs yeah. of the people involved. So I think the, the some of the most promising um, kinds of initiatives are coming out of um, food, uh, food movements, um, gardening and, and farming, alternative farming movements. There's a great project um, in Toronto um, called the Black Creek Community Farm, which prioritizes both thinking about our connections to land and our capacities to even know what we grow. Like I, you know, I always do this exercise with my big 800 student class and they can identify thousands and thousands of corporate logos. They couldn't identify three tree species. And one of the students, when
when they did try and identify a tree species, they guessed Christmas tree. So, you know, we have some real problems about just even learning where we are and what our ecologies are about, but also thinking about how can that be maybe a source of kind of re-embedding our economies um, and thinking about how um, that can also help us weather some of the kinds of extreme um, ups and downs of a more globalized form. Deborah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you've given us a lot to think about uh, some of the challenges that municipalities face when they're trying to reinvent themselves. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks so much. Thank it's been you. Great talking to you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.